Okay, we're going to get started with our next panel, solar power in coal country. We've got a couple of panelists uh, going first will be Evan Hansen, the president of Downstream Strategies. And uh, more importantly, he's our newest member of the House of Delegates, delegate-elect, like he can be sworn in next week. <laughs> Other distinguished guests we have today, another delegate from Mon County, Barbara Fleischauer, and Rodney Piles. And from the Morgantown City Council, Bill Kowacki. <laughs> anyway. So Evan's going to talk about some of the work that he and Downstream Strategies have done on what are the opportunities for developing solar in West Virginia, particularly on uh, uh, mine lands, also some solar policies. Autumn Long is the program director for uh, um, Solar United Neighbors, all about distributed solar in West Virginia, what we can do to scale up um, distributed solar, what sort of policies are necessary. So I'll turn it over to Evan and Autumn. Well, thank you, Jamie. I'm glad everyone came back. This is a long day, isn't it? <laughs> so we'll see what we can do to uh, be entertaining here. Um, so we're, we're here to talk about solar and coal country. And I know there's a lot of people in the room from West Virginia and may think, what? There's solar and coal country? And there actually is some, and there's two pictures of it up here. That top picture is the largest solar array in Pennsylvania, and the bottom picture is the largest solar array in Kentucky, which, as you'll notice, is right adjacent to a coal-fired power plant. And when you look at solar across the surrounding states to West Virginia and the number of megawatts that are installed, you'll see a, a big difference among the states, right? And these numbers are changing rapidly. These were accurate some number of months ago. Um, but North Carolina, for example, 4,400 megawatts of solar capacity. Uh, Virginia, 631 megawatts and rising rapidly, very rapidly in solar capacity. And West Virginia, that little yellow shape there is six megawatts. So we have six megawatts here. Again, these numbers change a little bit. We have six compared to hundreds or thousands of megawatts in surrounding states. And why is that? Is that because there's a big cloud over West Virginia and the sun shines everywhere else? <laughs> Figuratively speaking. <laughs> or is it that we have policies that keep solar out? Yes. We have policies here that are not very friendly to solar. And just to give some examples of that, several years ago we had an alternative and renewable energy portfolio standard in West Virginia. And we could argue about whether that really incentivized solar or not, but after the 2014 election in West Virginia and the Republicans took control of the legislature, their first act in the legislature in 2015 was to abolish the alternative and re renewable energy portfolio standard. And it's not just a partisan issue, though. I mean, people in West Virginia probably remember Senator Manchin's TV ads where he took a shotgun and shot up the cap and trade bill. And so, you know, there's things are a little different in West Virginia than some of these surrounding states. It's a challenging policy environment. And touching back to a question asked early in the day um, when Rafe was up here and somebody asked about how to address these issues in a West Virginia context and his answer, or at least part of his answer was, first we need to acknowledge um, the impact that West Virginia has or the contribution that West Virginia has to climate change. Um, I'm about to spend a lot of time in the state capitol, a lot more than I have, but I have been down there and participated in the process, and my, my understanding is that it's very rare for anyone to bring up climate change or to talk about the climate impacts of certain types of policies. But West Virginia has a big impact on climate change. So if you'll indulge me to do a little bit of math, because I'm a numbers person, think about those coal trains that come up 
through Morgantown, up along the Mon River, and all across West Virginia. And just one of those cars on a coal train holds about 100 tons of coal. And if you do the math to figure out how much carbon dioxide is emitted from that one coal car, it's about 275 tons of carbon dioxide. And I know these are just numbers. They don't mean that much in the abstract. But I think the takeaway message here is you're getting more carbon dioxide than the coal that you burned. And that's because it's combining with the oxygen in the air. And how much is 275 tons of carbon dioxide? Well, you could check my math here, but I think that's the same amount of CO2 you would emit if you hopped into your car and drove around the Earth 25 times. That's one car. And then think about West Virginia's total coal production. Now, it's varied a lot recently, and it's been going down. But if you just take a round number of 100 million tons per year, that's 275 million tons of CO2 from that coal once it gets burned. And it's going to get burned, right? That's why they mine it. And that's enough CO2 if you took every vehicle registered in West Virginia and drove every one of those vehicles around the Earth 45 times. That's the amount of CO2 that's going to be generated from the coal that we mine in West Virginia every year. So we're a small state. We have a small population, but we mine a lot of coal. And there's a lot of CO2 that we are responsible for. And that's part of what's missing in Charleston in the debate is any recognition of our responsibility of the share of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. So West Virginia plays a role in causing climate change. Um, West Virginia is also being harmed by climate change. Now, we talked earlier about Florida, and um, we know what might happen there. But we've already seen impacts here in West Virginia with some catastrophic flooding. And um, that climate assessment that came out the day after Thanksgiving, it, it even talked about West Virginia. It said in June 2016, torrential rainfall caused destructive flooding throughout many West Virginia towns, damaging thousands of homes and businesses, and causing considerable loss of life. Um, this was the storm that was the one in a thousand year storm, right? And these days we're seeing a lot of 500 year storms every few years. They're not supposed to happen that frequently. And there are people here like Angie in the room who lives on the Elk River in Clay County whose house was flooded, was never flooded before. And if you look at where her house is, you would think it never could possibly be flooded. But we're seeing these extreme weather events right here in West Virginia that are not just turning people's lives upside down, but they're killing people and they're costing millions and millions of dollars. And I think that's also part of what people need to recognize in Charleston, is that this isn't just for rich people who have big homes down on the Jersey Shore. It's people in Clay County here in West Virginia as well. So let's talk a little bit about developing solar on formerly mined land. Uh, we've done a series of reports, like Jamie mentioned, that look into solar opportunities in West Virginia, in West Virginia and policies that could, could promote the development of solar and make it take off a little bit faster. Um, one of those reports just came out a couple weeks ago. It's called Many Voices, Many Solutions. And this was a collaborative effort between several organizations. And the person on the downstream staff who, who did this report was Joey James, so he deserves a shout out. But essentially what this was, was looking in West Virginia and surrounding states at possible uh, redevelopment opportunities on abandoned mine lands that could make use of abandoned mine land, uh, abandoned mine pilot program funding, which is a federal program that's funneling money to coal states to try to not just reclaim these abandoned mine lands, but to turn them into economic, economically productive uses. And there's many different things that could be, on, be done on abandoned mine lands. Among them, one is renewable energy generation, and solar has particular promise. And this is probably not readable, but one of the projects that was written up in this report and for which an abandoned mine land pilot program application has been submitted is in Virginia. And this is in partnership with a private corporation that wants to site a, a solar array on an abandoned mine land to 
power a data center. Now we, data centers are those centers that house large numbers of computers, right? And there's a, more and more of these data centers as companies like Google and Apple and others take all of our data that we used to store on our own computers and we just upload it through the cloud now and they store it on theirs. And these are very energy intensive. And many of these companies have corporate sustainability goals and renewable energy goals to get upwards of 100% of their electricity from renewable energy. And this pilot program application, if it was funded, it would help make the economics a little bit better for this particular project. Now that doesn't mean it's not already happening because if you looked at those numbers and surrounding states that I showed on that first slide, one of the reasons why there's so much solar development in Virginia is due to these data centers and other corporations that are coming in with these high renewable energy targets. And they're specifically not coming to West Virginia for that reason. Even with the diversification that's occurred over the last few years, we're still generating 95 or so percent of our electricity from coal in West Virginia. And on top of that, our regulatory structures make it very difficult, if not impossible, to site large solar arrays here. Now we did a previous study, maybe about two years ago, that looked a little bit more systematically across different types of degraded land in West Virginia to identify how much land might be suitable for large-scale solar production. And by degraded land, we mean not just the abandoned mine lands, which are those that were abandoned before the SMACRA coal mining law took effect in 1977, but also those coal mines that were developed after SMACRA. And there's other types of degraded lands. There's landfills, hazardous waste sites, and others. And as a side note, I should say there are some solar developers that make it, that, that focus their efforts on putting solar on landfills, for example. This is done frequently across the country. These are not crazy ideas that I'm inventing. These, these happen all over the place. But focusing in on the, the post-1977 mine lands for a minute. So these, these are not the abandoned mine lands or AMLs. These are the, the mines that were uh, permitted under SMACRA. So in other words, they had to be reclaimed to certain standards and there was supposed to be some type of productive post-mine land use to benefit the economy. Well, there's a lot of those. There's hundreds of square miles of formerly mined land. And according to our analysis, of those hundreds of square miles, there was about 150 square miles that were potentially viable for large-scale solar at almost 900 sites. So this was a desk exercise. We didn't go and visit these sites, but this took into account factors such as slope, because you need a, an area that's relatively flat, um, proximity to the electric grid so that you can get the power out, and things like that. And this probably doesn't convey it that well, but this is one of the sites that we highlighted. It's, the, it's, a, it's a surface mine or a mountaintop removal site near Logan, I believe. And I think the take home message here is if you look at the contour lines, you can see like most of Southern West Virginia, it's, it's quite sloped, but when you get within the orange boundary, it's much more flat and it's much more suitable for solar development. And then the purple line on the right hand side uh, that's a transmission line that's in close proximity. So these are the types of things that we were looking for to try to identify sites um, on formerly mined lands that could potentially be developed for solar. Now, why would you want to put solar on these formerly mined lands? I think that's a fair question because we have a lot of land in West Virginia. And one reason is that it's really hard to find any economically productive use of these sites. So few of them have been developed. There's always a lot of talk about it, but there's not a lot of action. And so that's one reason. Another reason is why cut down a forest if you already have degraded land? You know, there's a lot of sensitive ecosystems in West Virginia. There are a lot of places that we want to avoid, and why not go on these sites that are already degraded? And in fact, with the, the pace of solar development in Virginia, they're getting concerned about how many square miles are being covered by solar now. It's the opposite kind of problem that we're having here. 
Now, in terms of trying to make these mine lands productive, solar can be part of the solution. It, it can help create jobs. I mean, clearly there's solar jobs that will be created during, uh, during installation. And I should note that across the country, there's 250,000 solar jobs now, and virtually none of those are in West Virginia. So we know it creates jobs. Uh, but it's not gonna create long-term jobs unless the solar electricity is used to attract industry and attract new businesses in here, and those are gonna be the long-term jobs that are created. But on these mine sites, you could stack solar along with other land uses. So there's organizations that are looking at multiple land uses on some of these sites to include not just renewable energy, but agriculture and tourism as well. But the long and the short of it is it's not happening, even though people have been talking about it for several years now. And it's gonna require some leadership and it's gonna require some action from many different stakeholders. So let me just go through these quickly and before I finish up. Uh, especially in Southern West Virginia, so much of the land is owned by these land holding companies, large land holding companies. And they have to be part of the solution. They've been sitting on this land for decades or hundreds of years. They've been collecting money from coal leases for a long time. Uh, some of them are hoping or hope maybe banking on uh, the coal industry making a resurgence. But I think there are more and more that are realizing that the coal industry is not gonna come back to where it was in the past and that they need to find new sources of revenue. And to the extent that we can get um, these large land holding companies on board, that will go a long way toward either getting a pilot project off the ground and or making a couple changes in state policy that would allow the free market to, to make these things happen. Um, the mining companies have fought renewable energy forever. They see it as a, th a threat to mining more coal. They've not been an ally in these efforts. Um, now there's, there's one potential economic benefit that I could think of that they would have, which is that if they're developing a new mine, um, there are certain requirements to reclaim that mine and return it to approximate original contour, which means if you've chopped the mountaintop off, you need to put the mountaintop back on, roughly. Um, but if you're gonna leave it as a site that is optimized for solar development, you could leave it flat because that's what you want for a solar array. So you could save quite a lot of money by reclaiming a mine for solar development. Corporate off-takers are definitely part of the solution. I mentioned that there's more and more corporations with renewable energy uh, targets and corporate sustainability goals, and they should be in here talking to our government leaders about what needs to change so that they could come into West Virginia and create those jobs. Um, the electric utilities are in a challenging situation in West Virginia, especially in Southern West Virginia where the population is shrinking so much because they have decreasing electric demand. And it's hard for them to get approval right now for large scale solar when they're not using their existing generating resources to their fullest. That's a challenge. Um, but I think the best way to think about the electric utilities benefiting from something like this is number one, um, across the country, electric utilities are benefiting from selling solar generated electricity. So we know it could happen, it's happening everywhere else. And number two, if we could actually use renewable energy as a way to attract employers into West Virginia and create jobs, we're gonna have a growing economy again. And then they'll be able to sell their current mix of energy along with this new um, these new, the new solar electricity. So I don't think it's necessarily a zero sum game. I think the, the utilities, if they're on board, if they're truly on board <laughs> to generate these new types of jobs, um, that's gonna benefit them in the long term as well. Um, nonprofits and activists definitely play a role. And we saw that earlier today with some of the uh, presenters and we'll see it in a few minutes with Autumn. And of course, the government leaders and regulators need to play a role too. We need to get some good bills passed. And maybe in the question and answer period, we'll talk about some of those. I think Autumn's gonna talk about one in particular. And then there's really two ways to go about this. One is to try to get a pilot project up and running where we get a large utility scale project on a formerly mined land, just to show a proof of concept that it can work. I mean, we know it'll work because it's working in surrounding states, but it would be nice to have a pilot project 
say, within driving distance of Charleston, so we could take some field trips and show people what it looks like. Uh, but on the other hand, we need some new policies for the private sector to move in and do it on their own, and these things really feed on each other. So I think we're looking for those different types of stakeholders to work together, both to get some pilot projects off the ground and to change policy. So we're gonna hear from Autumn next, who's gonna talk more about distributed solar and efforts to jumpstart that in West Virginia. So thanks, Evan. Um, you covered a lot of really important points, which makes my job easier. And thanks, everyone, for sticking around this afternoon. And of course, to the College of Law and to Friends of Blackwater for putting on this event, which has been a really great and diverse uh, group of speakers and topics. So I'm just very thankful to be part of it. Um, and I am going to talk a little bit more about solar and policy work that we can do here in West Virginia to help grow this industry. A lot of you already know me, but for those of you who don't, um, my organization is uh, a nonprofit, Solar United Neighbors. Um, we help people go solar. We educate about solar. That's a lot of what I do here in West Virginia is like basic public education about solar. And we advocate for solar. Um, we work with rooftop distributed solar specifically. Um, we have nine state programs. Um, our headquarters is in Washington, D.C. We've been doing this work for over 10 years, and we have been working in West Virginia since 2014. The late, great Bill Howley um, was originally head of the West Virginia program, so I'm honored to be carrying his work forward here in West Virginia. Um, and we're, we're um, expanding into Texas, Indiana, and Colorado in the coming years. So we're a rapidly growing organization with the goal of being a national voice for solar owners and solar supporters. And I think we're well on our way to accomplishing that. Um, West Virginia, because of some of the policy um, challenges we have here, is something of the redheaded stepchild of the Solar United <laughs> Neighbors um, universe. But they... Um, the organization is, you know, understanding and really understands the challenges we have in this state. So I am glad to have, you know, their support and the resources that they provide to do this. So I want to talk today about the economic benefits that solar can bring to West Virginia. We've talked a lot about the climate and environmental issues associated with energy and renewables and how renewables can be um, a solution. Uh, but I also really want to emphasize the economic development potential. Uh, and each of these points, I think, is worth digging into a little bit deeper. So first of all, solar can benefit West Virginia by saving you money. Um, can I see a show of hands how many of us here have solar on your home or business? That's awesome. That's like by far the largest percentage of solar owners that I've ever seen in one room at one time. So give yourselves a hand. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, you know, y'all, some of you maybe made this decision to go solar out of, you know, ideological choices, but I'm here to tell you, you don't have to care about climate change to benefit from solar energy. It will save you lots of money over the course of the lifetime of your solar system. So that is really what ends up moving the needle for a lot of people. And the costs have dropped um, just incredibly in the past 10 years alone, uh, costs for distributed PV have dropped 80%. So it's more affordable than it's ever been. It's an excellent investment. Uh, you have, there's really not much that you could point to that has a better return on investment than solar. Um, and there's still a 30% federal tax credit on the books through 2019, and then it starts stepping down. So I do encourage all of you who haven't gone solar yet, but can do so on your homes or business to 
you know, get on the bus sooner rather than later and take advantage of that 30% federal tax credit. We do not have any matching tax credits in West Virginia. Those um, expired several years ago, but the federal credit's still on the books. So um, yeah, it's, it's a great investment. It saves people money and it creates good local jobs. Um, solar PV installer is the fastest growing occupation in the nation and it's projected to more than double in the number of jobs in this occupation between now and 2026. It's got a growth rate of over 100%. Um, and fun fact, the second fastest growing job in the nation is wind turbine technician. So renewable energy, not just solar, but you know, in several sectors, is um, a huge economic opportunity, um, an opportunity for good local jobs. These are well-paying skilled trades um, of the skilled blue collar trade that we are very familiar with here in West Virginia. And you know, we are a historical energy state and we can continue to be an energy state in the 21st century if we adapt to the changing realities of our energy system. And adv advancing solar job growth and entrepreneurship is one major way that we can do that. Uh, and um, it will spur economic development if we invest in solar. There are thousands and thousands of solar companies nationwide. There are very few in West Virginia. There's about half a dozen installation companies, most of which are very small, like one or two man shops. Um, but there's a huge amount of potential for growth here in this, in this state. And as Evan mentioned, oh, over 250,000 Americans are directly employed in the solar sector today. That number is creeping up toward 300,000. And to give you a comparison, there are less than 53,000 coal mining jobs left in the United States. So this is a huge growth sector. Um, and I, you know, part of what motivates me to do this work is to ensure that West Virginia doesn't get left out of this opportunity. Um, and as as Evan also mentioned, there are many major global corporations who have mandated their own internal corporate renewable um, programs. There are, as of yesterday, 156 major global companies that have committed to 100% renewable energy. Uh, and these are just a few of those. So it's not just the tech companies, although they are leading the way, and the five largest publicly traded companies in the world have all signed on to 100% renewable energy mandates. But there's also many companies in banking and finance, there's many food and beverage corporations, textiles, um, it, it runs the gamut. So as, as Evan mentioned, it, you know, these companies are not going to locate and invest in West Virginia unless they have access to the renewable energy that they demand to meet their own internal mandates. So we're essentially leaving a lot of money on the table and a lot of opportunity for bringing new jobs and employers to this state. And so I'll point out actually, um, one of the companies that is a 100% renewable um, is P&G, Procter & Gamble, which already has um, operations here in West Virginia, and even GM, you know, car makers. So that's all the good news about solar as a great growth industry and a really exciting sector to work in. Um, now I'm going to tell you the bad news, which is that West Virginia really hasn't been able to take advantage of this. And similar to the um, map that Evan had up earlier, you know, in comparison to our surrounding states, and I want to shout out Perry Bryant for making this awesome map for me. Um, thank you, Perry. Uh, we are falling very far behind, both in terms of our installed solar capacity and the number of jobs associated with solar. So I think the, the latest number I have is that we're at seven megawatts uh, statewide, which is a paltry sum, none of which is large scale, utility scale solar, that's all distributed rooftop small school solar um, as compared to you know Virginia to the east um, they've got thousands and thousands of jobs in this sector now and there are a few reasons for that but it comes down to policy policy matters that's what's driving this growth in other states and what's preventing it here so there's a couple of specific policy issues that would 
be very helpful to our state in terms of growing the solar industry. Um, Evan mentioned the renewable portfolio standard of which we uh, do not have that. And then I wanna talk a little bit more um, in more detail about power purchase agreements, which are a widely available financing mechanism for solar projects. Um, they are legal in at least 26 states, according to uh, Desire, which is a great resource for solar information if you're interested, including regulated utility states like West Virginia. And they allow a third party developer to install and operate a solar array on a host customer's property. And the customer agrees to pay a fixed rate for the energy produced by that array. And that rate is typically lower than that of the local utility company over a fixed time period, typically 10 to or excuse me, 15 to 20 year lease term. Sometimes you have the option to buy at the end. So this is a really important way to allow institutions and especially commercial businesses and tax exempt institutions to access solar. Um, commercial businesses very commonly use power purchase agreements to go solar and with, uh, with tax exempt entities like our schools, local municipalities, churches, any nonprofit, um, this is also really helpful for them. It's also one step toward the establishment of community solar. It in and of itself doesn't get you there, but it's a, it's a critical prerequisite to developing community solar. Um, and, and the bottom line is it allows a customer to install solar with low to zero upfront cost. And that's the main barrier that we see is, you know, that upfront investment, even if you, you know, if you know it's going to be a great investment and it's going to pay off over time, that doesn't matter if you don't have the capital upfront to invest in that ownership of your own solar array. So um, this is a really appealing financing, financing option for businesses and institutions. Um, and it allows you to lock in an electric rate that's predetermined, so you're hedging against future rate hikes by the local electric utility. And our uh, electric rates in West Virginia have gone up a lot in the past 10 years, and we expect to see that to continue. Um, so this is a good way for businesses to stabilize their monthly expenditures, and for tax-exempt institutions um, who can't take advantage of that 30% tax credit I mentioned, PPAs allow the developer to capture that tax credit, and then they can pass along those savings to the customer in the form of lower electric rates. So it's a great tool for tax-exempt entities as well. Um, we are spearheading a advocacy campaign here in West Virginia to push for the legalization of power purchase agreements. It's really our policy priority going into 2019, looking ahead to the legislative session. Um, we have developed a really great, uh, I have a really great steering committee who are actually well represented here today. Several of my steering committee members are in the room, so thanks y'all. And uh, we have a broad coalition of supporters. I'm really excited about this work because it is a bipartisan effort. There is appeal from both sides of the aisle there's interest from both sides of the aisle to legalize this, uh, this structure to, to finance solar. So if you would like to get involved in that work, uh, I encourage you to visit our website. I also have a petition outside on the table with the, um, the yellow tablecloth that says Solar United Neighbors on it. You could sign the paper petition or go online and contact your legislators and let them know that you support this. Um, we are gonna be also launching um, the West Virginians for Energy Freedom Coalition in support of this effort as well. So within about the next week, we'll have that website up and running and we'll be working through that banner to promote this in terms of energy freedom in West Virginia. So I'm going to wrap it up, but uh, if you want to follow up or you have questions, I don't know if we have much time for questions now. Um, and then also just Quickly, if you are in the north central region of West Virginia and you're interested in going solar, we do have an active local group in this area now. So take a flyer home with you, visit the table, um, tell your friends. Thank you.
time for a couple of questions. Uh, Autumn talked about what the legislative changes is necessary to legalize power purchase agreements. We had a question, what specific legislation is needed to further utility scale solar? Delegate Hansen, Delegate Elect Hansen. How's this sound? Good, good, all right. Right, so Autumn, Autumn is focusing on rooftop solar, which is great and much needed, and we need to pass that bill. Um, but that's not gonna do that much for a large corporation that needs a lot of solar. Um, so one thing that, that we have been talking about, which I hope to have a bill for, is called limited open access. We, what we don't wanna do is blow up the whole system. This is a, a regulated um, electric system here in West Virginia, and we've got um, two utilities, and, and there's a lot of resistance to change. But I think it, one idea is to tie solar development to these abandoned coal mines or to the, the any previously mined land and to carve something out very specifically that allows renewable energy to be to be placed on this previously mined land in order to to um, generate electricity for a company with a corporate sustainability goal uh, the, the challenge right now is we the the best sites for solar development and especially if we're gonna target them on that degraded land, isn't necessarily gonna be where a company's gonna to wanna to site their operations. They're gonna be far apart from each other, but that shouldn't be a deterrent. We should actually incentivize that so that we can put the solar in a, in a good place and have the company locate in a good place. So there, there, are, there are some ways to, to make changes in state code to allow that. A question here, I see a lot of solar panels that are not optimally installed, i.e. shading, orientation, et cetera. Has anyone calculated the difference between megawatts of solar installed as opposed to megawatts of solar produced? I don't know if this is something you guys. Um, the, I mean, I can tell you that the utilities are required to submit annual reports to the state PSC that, um, that detail the uh, number of kilowatt hours that they actually receive through distributed net metering, as well as the kilowatt capacity. So you could dig into those numbers and you know look into like the efficiencies of that. I, I don't know off the top of my head. This is more of a technical question. How reliable are converters? Do solar companies have difficulty getting parts and are there sufficient technicians to, to uh, repair and keep and operate and maintain? Solar panel. Sure, I can probably handle that. Um, so inverters are an important component of a solar system. They convert the DC energy that the solar panels produce into the alternating current that's used in your typical home or business. Um, all of the components of a solar system are warrantied, and the warranties are really excellent. So solar panels are typically warrantied for 25 years. That's industry standard. Um, and so, you know, you, if a company is willing to put a 25-year warranty on their product, you can, you know, feel confident that they are confident in it. Um, there are a couple different types of inverters. Uh, one type is typically warrantied for 10 to 12 years. Another type is typically warrantied for 25 years as well. So inverters, yeah, they're um, they're generally very um, very fine. Like they work fine. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Got time for one more question? Maybe any questions from up here? That's correct. Uh, for you know, a typical homeowner, it would not be worth the extra expense to do a tracking system. And with net metering over the course of the year, you know, if depending on the angle of your roof, it's maybe better in summer, maybe better in winter, but it evens out over the course of the year. Any other questions? Um, what, 
Yeah, what I hear from installers, um, we haven't seen pricing impacts for customers. Um, that is more impactful on the very large scale for utility scale solar, where the margins are really, really thin. Um, for distributed rooftop solar, um, the installers have been able to you know, internalize those costs. Mm, there have been like equipment availability issues because large companies have bought up a lot of stuff ahead of the tariffs. So just availability has become somewhat problematic. Okay, I think that's it. Let's have a nice round of applause for Evan and Alan.